Great. So I'm going to talk about uh, individuals and interactions. Uh, I don't like to talk too much about myself. Uh, I call myself a creative uh, collaboration coach and uh, an agent. Uh, coach doesn't work in this uh, context because uh, abbreviation would be something not nice in Belgium. Um, some people might know that I, uh, at home I'm working in a, on a walking desk. So I'm, I'm uh, moving a lot when I'm, I'm working at home, but uh, that's, I think, enough about me. Uh, I was scheduled to do this talk to, together with Christina. Uh, unfortunately, she told me or she mailed me while I was on holiday that uh, she wouldn't be able to join me. So, uh, and because I prepared everything with her and most of the presentation was uh, from her, uh, I decided to, to change everything and, and to do something else. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so I am um, standing on uh, the shoulders of a lot of giants today. Uh, these are all people who send me tips for, for a book that I'm working on. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to use whatever a, a lot of the, the ideas from them. Um, so, but before I start, what I would like you to do is think for one minute about at this right moment, what is your currently your biggest problem that you have? So try to think about. Oops, that doesn't work. Huh? Uh, should work. Yes, yes. So we think about one minute for the biggest problem you currently have in your life. It could be personal, it could be work related. Think for one minute. Okay, I hope you all have something. What I would like you to do now is talk to your neighbor. Talk to your neighbor and explain your problem. You have 30 seconds because we have about one minute to explain both parts. Okay, that's fine. Okay. I think, I think you noticed that the second minute went a lot faster than the first one. Um, the idea is for this presentation, what I would like you to do, I would like to do is to inspire you. I want to give you some ideas. I want to inspire you. Um, and what you will notice is I will use a lot of storytelling, but in a lot of cases I will talk about things that happened uh, uh, in my personal life. I will try not to give you too much examples of the company, because if I give examples of what I do inside companies, people will always say, oh, but my company is different. In Prague, this doesn't work like this, or in Russia, it doesn't work like that, or whatever. In every country, there is a reason why it doesn't work like the way it's working at, at my place. So that's why I decided I'm giving examples from my personal life, and I assume that you're all smart enough to translate it how it works in, in your company. Um, and I, I talked about Jerry. Jerry is also one of the people who died uh, this summer, unfortunately. And one of the ways to bring respect is, is to 
to bring and share these ideas. And when I asked Jerry for a tip, the last uh, interaction I had with him, he, he, he gave a warning. He said, well, oops, yeah, okay. no one tip will give the quantum jump. Please don't look for a silver bullet. And there will be lots of tips in here, but if you try all of them, at the same time, it will not work. And just one, yeah, if, if you have one thing and you expect that everything will be better, no, it will take some time. Try just one. Start with one. Don't work with many of them at the same time. Oops. Be patient. Because if you work on something, typically when we start on a tip, we immediately want to have it work, and then we expect by the next minute, the next morning, all oh, everything will be better. No, please take the time. So, have small steps for a very long period. Just take the time. There will be a temporary backlash. Whatever you do, when you try out something new, it's not going to be perfect, it's not going to be better immediately. Actually, in a lot of cases, it will be worse. And some of you might recognize this. The way he talks about this is really the severe model of change. Who knows this model? Many. So what happens with the city, what uh, Virginia Satir said is that you have some status quo. There is some situation that you have, and then you start something, a foreign element. So we have a tip, we have an ID, we do something, and there will be resistance. There will always be resistance. You might not see it, but there will be resistance. And then after a while, you will run into chaos. Things will go a lot worse. And so many people then stop because they say, well, you see, it's not working. Well. You have to know that every time when you do a change, well, every time, it's dangerous to use the word every time and always, in most cases, you will run into chaos and things will get a lot worse and it will take a while before something will happen and gradually it will be integrated and gradually things will go a lot better. And that will end up, I'm sure it doesn't show anymore, um, and then will end up with a new status quo. Now, this picture is rather dangerous because it gives the impression that the new status quo will always be better than the late status quo. That might not be the case. You might end up here. Uh, it's much nicer to show it like that, but that's not always the case. But when, when Jerry talked about it, the, in the tip he said, just choose one thing at a time. And what a lot of people are doing is this. They do one thing, oh, they're into chaos, now they're already starting a new thing, and another, and another, and another, and another, and then it will take ages before things will actually start to improve. Because we're doing multiple... Who's doing this at this company? Come on. It must be much, much more. Okay. So, limiting the changes in progress. Try to work one thing at a time and give it the time before things go better and only then start doing something else. Which is really, really hard. Because this time... You might think it's days, hours, it might be weeks, it might be months, and in some companies it might be years. And of course, we don't wait for years because we do want to, hey, we do want to work as an agile coach or a scrum master. Our value is to bring in change and new stuff. But that might end us up with this instead of this. And one of the other people that gave me a tip was, was Mike Cohn, who said, okay, the scrum police are coming. What the hell does it mean? And he says, there's a lot of people talking about, you're not doing scrum right, or you're not doing this or that sort of thing. What he says, he said, uh, okay, if you're completely new into Agile and if you never worked with it, start from a book. Start any book. I could give, I, I, I was tempted to put books in here, but I have about 60 or more books about Agile at home, and they're all different by design. Why they're different? They're different because somebody wrote about what happened in this or that company and then wrote that down okay. and tells it this is going to work everywhere. No, this is what works in one, two, maybe ten companies, probably never hundreds, because nobody has the experience to work on hundred companies and be there full time and understand what's happening. So start by the book, any book. Get some real life experience. Learn from it. Experiment. You try something different. And then, oops, I'm not sure what's happening. Okay. Uh, push the boundaries. 
Try something else. Go some further. So, push new boundaries. Try new things. I'm trying it out a new clicker. Uh, so, don't accept dogma. Huh? Because uh, you start out to write a book and it really says, work this way. This is good to try out because you don't want to start experimenting and changing stuff before you actually tried it, which is what some people should do. But once you experiment, once you push the boundaries, try out new things, then you can start out and, and say, well, maybe for whatever reason, this is not going to work in my company. And um, oops, okay, let's continue this, this way. So basically what he says is, the, the start of the manifesto, a lot of people forget this line, but I think it's the most important one. Uncover better ways of developing software by doing it and helping other people doing it. Huh? So basically what he says is, this is just a joke, there is no strong police. Huh? So there's nobody who actually has the authority to say you have to do it this or that way. Another person that goes into that uh, was one uh, was Katrina, he gave me a very nice story about uh, different ways of, of bringing bugs, she's a tester, of bringing bugs to a team. Now that's kind of hard to visualize that. So uh, I looked for different ways of Kanban boards. So this is uh, a picture that I, I, I downloaded some years ago. Some, some lady working at home, which is probably just some, some to-do list that she's working on. This is um, an actually burn-up chart for my son. I think he was about eight or nine. He had to write a book review uh, on a book he, he needed to read, but he's dyslectic, so it's really hard for him to read. So we started to, to collect, okay, this is the, the pages he's reading, and then what he wrote down, and, and stuff like that. So just to visualize, this is what he still has to do at that time. So just a way to visualize him and helping him on where he is on the spot. This is a large board electronic one in, inside a factory on things that they're creating. This is from, um, I forgot the guy's name, but this is some from uh, an agile coach who started to use his own, own personal Kanban board, which is it to do. Uh, it's done, and this is from friends that are helping out. Another more technical thing, but this is the one I like most. This is an actually scrum board using in a team. As you can see, this this boat is way too hard, a big to pass this because these are the things that are doing actually. So it's limiting, it's a physical bottleneck to make sure that they can't work on too many things. And this thing is a very large story, which is a large boat that actually has to be cut down into smaller boats that can pass, and this is a kind of islands where they, they went up to. Huh? It's a company working on software for boats. How could you tell? So they visualize on what they're working on. Eh? And this is also a nice one. Uh, it's, it's, it's not in use at that time when the picture was taken, but this is, if you look very carefully, yeah, you recognize it's Pac-Man, but did you also see that there is a to-do and it is a DOM? And you might see this is iOS, this is Android, this is Windows, this is some backend. So this is a real, actually, board that they were using for stories that they want to deliver. These are the stories, and these are the bugs. Just the picture that they took uh, uh, after um, uh, at some specific time. Just showing you there's multiple ways of, of how to do this. Um, and so I, I translated the, the story that Katrina says to one size is not for the whole. But actually, Jukat said this morning something very nice about this headset because it didn't fit. And actually, what she translated to is that one size fits no one, which I really like. If you want to force it to everybody, it's actually not working for no one. And then another tip brings me right back to the tip that Jutta uh, sent me back uh, when I asked her for tips. She said, the real question to ask people is, are you really doing this? Okay. Because as coaches, we're asked to do, to help people to, um, I don't know, multiple things, to ask people to be more uh, team profiles, to improve ourselves, to be coachable, and to coach people. But are we coaches also coachable ourselves? Are we actually doing it? This is an example from a picture, and it's not that visible here, but this is Philippe Lomé, who's the coach in France. And he took uh, his son and my son back climbing. And what's interesting about this is that not only does he, so he's securing his son, explaining it at the same time, but of course he's up there as well. So he's doing it, and he's showing it how he's doing it. This takes a lot of time. 
What you don't see on this picture that's here is a lot of people who are getting frustrated because he's not moving that fast. They would like him to just secure them and that they can move on faster. But that's just the first, I don't know, first two trees that they have to pass. And by halfway, they just speed up because these two kids are doing it themselves and they just go very fast. And these other people who were complaining at the start, they were almost uh, at the beginning because it takes a very long time for them to do their kids, which is actually he's doing it, showing it, and teaching at the same time. We talked about David this morning. Um, David was supposed to send me a tip for the book as well. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away before he could send me. But I thought about one of the tips that he gave me, I think about 10 years ago, is that when you're a coach and you come inside a company, look at the comics that are at the wall. If you see billboards, if you see this or that, these billboards, whatever pictures you see at the wall, these are the problems that people are actually having and they're not allowed to talk about in the company. If I'm there the first day, they will never tell me about certain things. They will never tell me that Jira is a kind of Halloween product and they think I'm really bad. They won't tell me that. But they will visualize it at the wall and I will see it and I can have something to think about that. That's something I've learned from, from David. I've used it over the past 10 years and it really helped me a lot. Sometimes even when I see these things and I ask people about it, they're even afraid to talk about it to talk about that elephant in the room, even if it's there at the wall, shouting to everyone, this is a problem here. But if I ask about it, they won't acknowledge it. So that's, um, yeah, that's one way of telling people. Claire is one of the others who sent me an email and she talked about, we have to, and, and this links a lot with what uh, Tita said earlier on, she talks about we have as coaches, as scrum masters, we have to facilitate learning. We have to teach people to learn and, and to work with that. And one of the interesting things about it that she said in that conversation is that a lot of people, yeah, they're just afraid to look stupid. Yeah? They really, yeah, they want to do whatever to look smart. And that's really important because, because of that, what happens is that they will look for that, yeah, that reassuring line, even if they know it's a lie. Yeah? But they want to look smart because the inconvenient truth is really hard to talk about. And so this is, and we might judge them. We might think, how stupid are they? And why do they still hang on to that lie? Well, I will tell you why. Because if their job depends on that lie, they will not want to see the truth. They're really scared that, that, yeah, that, that lie, if it will t be taken away, that they might ha not have a job. Okay. This is the, the word that uh, Upton Sinclair said about it. And his salary or her salary depends on it. That's what people want that line. So basically what I'm uh, saying is that, uh, or what um, Claire is saying is that we should look and respect people and one of them is respect genius. Now this is a very interesting picture. This is my son Bent, I think age of 10. And uh, he was playing with me um, with, with another startup, Lean Startups, a game called It's B Game, a game that was invented in Belgium by a couple of friends of mine. And he was, uh, so I was asked to do that and it was holiday, so I said, won't you join me? And he, he played the product owner. Now here are a bunch of people, business people who think of themselves that are really smart. They're trying to invent new things and they have a 10 year old person who is the product owner. So, of course, they ignore them because they didn't take him seriously. But in this game, the product owner is the person who has to accept the, the products that are created. And so they didn't ask any questions. They didn't do anything with it. So they just built their products, what they thought they needed to build, and they delivered it to the product owner. And he said, no. And we're like, what? What the fuck? You're, you're 10 years old. You should expect that. Really going angry, they tried to bribe him and, and get, really giving him like 10 euros, thinking, oh, 10 year olds, he will just think, uh, try to 50 euros and all of other things. And he just didn't accept it. And later on, we debriefed it. And I said, this is, this has happened regularly, that you don't take your clients seriously. And there was one guy, when I talked to him, he looked at me and said, damn it, we're building products for teenagers. And we're not talking to them. 
And we don't understand why they don't like our products. Yeah, I do understand. They didn't take them seriously. So this just happens a lot. And when I talk with respect for juniors, this is a nice story, but I see it all in, in different ways. Juniors actually have, and I, I take the word junior very broadly, it could be somebody who has 20 years of experience with his junior in your company, doesn't know your company well, or doesn't know the product well. So I think it's very broadly. But do understand, we are all juniors at one point. We might join a new company, we might join, I don't know, a new sector, we might join something else where we don't know much about it. And we have a lot of power because we do ask the hard questions and we do ask some, some of these things. But of course, as a team, you need to respect them. And as a scrum master or as a coach, we need to respect the people that we're serving, right? our teams that we're working with. We need to make sure that we respect these people. So that, that's also important. But one of the things that a lot of people forget about is we should respect the people above us, these managers. It's very tempting to come in as an agile coach and to just dismiss them and say, oh, these managers are just stupid. They created the environment you're in now, and we don't respect them. One of the first times I did this thing, I talked about that, there was just a manager sitting in front of me just whispering to me, just thank you, because it was like, wow, finally somebody sees me as a person. All these agile coaches, they used to say, these managers are like, mad, they don't understand anything. We just fire them all and every problem is gone. Huh? No, we need to respect these people who are above us. In this sense, we need to respect all different kinds of people. Huh? So they might look strange, and this might, this is the picture taken from, because this, this kid had. He didn't want to do his, his communion. He said, I want to do some different kind of party, and let's throw a, a, a party in, in the middle of the woods, and let's do it like in the Middle Ages. And these are the grandparents, and they, well, maybe they didn't like it because of the fact that, okay, they, they Christian, and maybe they should have a communion. But no, they respected that, and they spent some money to look really into the team of this. As respect to this boy, who says, hey, this is my party, this is the way I want to treat it. And we all have different kind of people in different kind of ways. We should try to respect them. That is different. And can I continue to say, okay, and this is a lot of people, or some of the people who are on this picture are here. And we lead by example by constantly asking simple questions at every opportunity and showing people, showing juniors, showing large managers, or showing people in your team that actually simple questions can help a lot. And uh, I was new at a certain company, I think five, six years ago, uh, second day or third day, I don't remember anymore, and I was in a meeting, and it was really a big, almost a fight, I was, well, not, they might not kill each other, but people were actually shouting to each other, to developers, because they disagreed. And I just said, well, sorry, maybe it's just because I'm new, but I would like to, to have an understanding. What does this word mean? And one of them stopped shouting, looked at me and says, that word, that means this. And the other looked at them and said, oh, if that's the definition of that word for you, then I agree with you. And the word I'm talking about is product. A very stupid word like product, one person was thinking about the product that was delivered for the customer, and another was thinking about an internal product. And they didn't understand it because they both used the same word. Because I was rather new, I could just say the stupid, simple question. Sorry, just what do you mean with product? Because I'm not sure, I'm, I'm rather new here. And this is what's really important. We should be, yeah, and this is where juniors are really good at, we should be asking these questions, these simple questions, because it will reveal a lot of things. And these seniors, that, there were a lot of seniors at the table that might have maybe not sure what the product means or what the word is. I was pretty sure that they meant something different, but yeah, was just, okay, let's just simply asking the question, what does it mean? Because we want to encourage everybody that we have knowledge gaps. We're into IT, this is a long-lived journey, we have to learn all the time, so we all have journey gaps. But we should not see that as a problem. We have to acknowledge that and know that this is, hey, this is how we learn. So I have an example of that. Who has ever seen a picture of a real unicorn? Not, not in, 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 um, in movies and whatever, but a real unicorn. Huh? 
I have one for you that you probably have never seen. But so, if you think about the definition of a unicorn, that's an animal with one corn. Well, this is one. It's probably not the one you were thinking about because you were thinking about white and being very small and whatever. But hey, this is a gray and a fat one, and it's called a rhinus. Huh? It's, it's a different kind of animal. But maybe, I don't know, the first time when they talked about unicorns, this was, this was actually a rhinus that was sick and that was, I don't know, was white for whatever reason, and then it moved on and had the same thing. Okay, this is a nice joke or a bad joke, whatever. Uh, but it shows you that if you think out of the side of the box, you might actually learn about some animals that might fit that definition and other kinds of definitions. So what we want to do is we want to celebrate learning, yeah? and we want to think about learning not just as knowing something, but celebrate the thirst for knowledge. This is my daughter, two and a half years. She's not able to read at all at that time. She's never. She, she's not able to even read if she read it. But she's looking into comics and really trying to understand. And what I think is really important in, in this kind of thing, and this is the, the message that Claire tries to bring here, is that knowledge, we, we praise all the time knowledge of being people to know something. But actually, yeah, it gives a lot of people, um, especially perfectionists, move them much more into the um, 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 imperfection syndrome and um, imposter syndrome because they think, oh, I have to know something immediately. Well, this is not true. Most of the time, we need to work really hard to understand something. Okay? And if you just celebrate knowing, then it will look like everybody knows something out of the box. No, most of the things we know, we have to work really, really hard for that. And we have to encourage people. Where I put it like that, we have to enable growth. We have to teach the people around us to work on growth and we have to help them grow. When I was, ages ago, uh, about 20 years, I was a DJ in a, very, in a local club, my local uh, 15 minutes of fame. And so, um, uh, two years ago, I think, two years ago, they asked me back. They were closing the club and they asked a few people from the old uh, times back if they wanted to go back. And of course, everybody was interested in to have these top spots uh, after midnight, after two o'clock, which is a lot of people in there. But I thought, hmm, my son was also interested in DJing, had already had some courses in it and wanted to learn from it. And I said, okay, let's use this opportunity to enable his growth to, to play for an audience. So I said, okay, instead of fighting for the top spot, let's put me in the beginning. And where everybody, all these other DJs, as received half an hour, an hour, we received two hours because nobody wants to be up front. And we had two hours where he could experiment with it and he could do things and I could teach him some stuff and he could teach me a lot of other stuff because I've never worked with Spotify on pain because that just doesn't exist. And so we both learned from each other and we, we grew, helped grow each other in, in doing these kind of things, which is interesting. This is another picture from... Um, a local, what I would call serial entrepreneur, Bart, who went with his daughter, I don't know, some facilities in my local town. And uh, Meryl was interested into doing some, some hula hoop things, uh, but she was afraid to do that. You don't see it, there's some audience there. And she was afraid to do that there. And he just said, okay, I'll just go with you. And of course, he's, who's the expert here? It's not Bart, and you can clearly see it. He's not the expert. Huh? Meryl is the expert. But he was afraid to do to go out there, and Bart, in his, he's, uh, he has a few IT companies. He knows that life is about long learning, and we have to keep learning and, and learn new stuff, and not be afraid to learn new stuff. And I think he, he wants the same thing for his kids as well. He wants them to show that hey, at every opportunity, you should not be afraid to shine and try out, and maybe make a fool of yourself in front of an audience, but learn something. And it actually brings us to what Sam told me, is that when you want to work in a company, you have to arrive with your whole heart. I don't believe in work-life balance. I believe in work-life fusion. I want to work as much as possible. Some people have seen me, uh, well, I've shown some pictures where I did some work with Ben. I did a presentation with, or multiple presentations already with Joppa in an audience, helping them, learning them, and, and bringing the whole thing. 
making sure that I'm that one person. I'm not a work person and, and a, a personal person. I'm just one person. So we have to bring the whole heart of it. And that means that if I have a bad night's sleep, I would need to let you know the team know. If you have something, some problems at home, if you have some things, I have to tell the team, like, look, maybe I didn't sleep very well, we had some problems at home, and that might not uh, be the best day. So maybe you leave me a little, little bit alone. But maybe I feel really great, and I have a lot of energy, and I can, I can literally walk on fire and help the team today. I should bring that as well, so because I have both of these things. And one way of doing that um, is, 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 is bringing intimacy into the team and showing the team, hey, this is the whole team. It's just not, not just me who is a whole person, but you as well. And I do this by, um, one of the things I, I like to work with is, uh, in retrospective, use a check-in, mad, gl- uh, mad, glad, sad, afraid, so talking about how I'm feeling. Huh? I'm, um, I'm glad to be here. But I'm mad that uh, I have some problems with the clicker, some stuff like that, but bringing in the whole person and asking people to do that. They feel very awkward about it. They, most of them don't like it at the beginning, but it's one of the ways of how they learn to, to know each other. So they, they learn a lot more. Another thing is journey lines. Uh, when I start a team, or if I do a rekindle of a team, uh, this is a technique I learned from both Lisa Atkins and uh, Johanna Rotman. It's to ask people to talk about their life. And it could be, they could start for me anywhere they want. They could start when they were born or they could start when they were, um, when they just started at this company or when they started in the industry. And I have really people talk that's been working. For example, I did one a few months, months ago that people have been working for more than a year together and all of a sudden for the first time they're talking about, hey, when I was, I don't know, well, the, the, the most crazy example, I burned down a house, I, um, I got married last week and nobody knew, some stuff that I heard as well, uh, or I'm getting married in a few weeks, nobody knows, uh, other things about uh, somebody had a, a child who died a few years ago, and some, that brings the whole person, that makes you understand a lot more. Or I'm getting through a difficult divorce and this is why the last two weeks I don't have much time because I have to take care of some, some paperwork. So basically bringing the whole person and making you see each other as a whole person. And um, some things that's related to that is that inside companies it's really important yeah, to know, not always ask for permission. Yeah, or the way uh, Grace Hopper said it, to beg for permission. And I think Ita said something about this this morning as well, is that we do know what we can do inside companies. Yeah? We're not talking about you can do anything you want. You know if you work inside a company what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And if it's in a large bank, there will be less things acceptable than if you're in a startup. We do know that. We know our culture. But for whatever reason, sometimes people don't do it. And the craziest thing I've ever heard is that a very small company, and I'm talking 10, 12, 12 people, yeah, they were looking to have a client, a large contract that would help them and, and really something they worked for months and years to, to get that contract. And then at the moment that there is a fax, this is talking about 10, 15 years ago, you can hear, it's a fax that's arriving at the company saying, okay, we agree to it, but we're not sure on how quick you are because you're a small company. If you can send a response within X number of hours, we will go with it. Unfortunately, at the moment that the fax arrives, the CEO of this company was in the hospital for removing an of, a, of an appendix. He was, he was out in surgery. And for whatever reason, everybody who fought for this, everybody who worked with it, was too afraid to sign it and say, yes, it's okay. And they lost the contract. And the CEO was like, what the hell? You know I would approve it. Yes. Why didn't you sign it? Well, we weren't sure if we could sign it. Duh. They knew he couldn't sign it because he was used out. So we know what's the right thing. We can do these things. But then one of the tips I received that was very interesting, I received a tip from Michael who said the opposite. Yeah? Don't ask for permission. Yeah? Ask for permission might be, uh, ask for permission sometimes. But what he said is ask for permission when you work with people. 
when you work with people, you don't want to just, and that, this is why I think that this sentence is, makes a lot more sense, you don't want to inflict help on people. I could just say, okay, I could look at Olaf and see that some things are wrong and say, Olaf, you have to do this or that and that. And when he doesn't see that he has a problem, okay, he, will not, uh, he will not accept it. And he will just think that, oh, no, this is crazy. I had this when I was in high school. I had a lot of trouble uh, with learning French. And I had a, a very nice French teacher who tried to ask me all the time. But because she did it in a way that without asking my permission, it actually backfired and I was really mad at her and I didn't accept any help. Because she never asked me if I saw the problems. I, didn't, I, I knew I had some problems, but I didn't realize what were my problems. And she never asked if I wanted to help her too much. So she inflicted a lot of help with me and that actually backfired. So that's really important to, to, to see that. And, and related to that is making sure that you, you ask for no. That we, there's a lot of books. There's a very powerful book about uh, negotiation that is getting to yes. But I think it's uh, actually not always good because no is really an important thing. If you work with somebody, a lot of people have a hard time saying no. Okay? And if you're getting to yes, you remember, you, you might all have that phone call. Yeah? You have this large marketing person uh, calling you up and asking all these questions. Do you like water? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't want to say yes, but yes, of course, uh, I, I know water is better than coffee or whatever things. But they, they keep asking all these yes questions, and you know this is going to lead to a few questions to tell you something. And so basically, all these yeses I'm saying at the phone are all fake yeses, or ways to dismiss and I want to get rid of the conversation. But what you really want is to hear a no, because once you have a no, you know that's reality, and then you can go to real questions, and then you can the real negotiation starts. Then you can go, this is what might be a problem, and we can continue with that. And Diana puts it like this, and this is again related to, to what you tested at the end, is that yeah, we want to become continuous learners. Yeah? Agile is about yeah, continuous learning and modeling it. Now, this is the interesting thing, and, and you and our model talked about yeah, showing it to people. There will be a lot of people here on stage uh, in, in the next two days. And you might think, oh, we're all, uh, I don't know, famous or, or good and smart and whatever. But that's not how it works. You don't get uh, famous or you don't get to talk and write books about it because you know it. No, it's the opposite around. You try something out, you model it, you share it with a lot of people, and then you get a lot of feedback why this won't work or why other things. And then you learn and then you get smart. Because you dare to be on a stage and you dare to share it and then you learn some things. Because it's way faster to learn it by modeling it. So what I would like you to do now is think for a minute. I shared a lot of things. Yeah. What did you learn? Yeah. Is there something that you did learn? Hopefully. What was the something that you want to remember? And Fred asked me about what do people want to remember. What I said to him is that it, it's not about what I think I want you to remember. It's about what you want to remember. So. Think about it. What did you learn? And what I would like you to do now is consult with your neighbor okay, and share with what you learned where you think it could help this person in his problem. Don't think about your problem because you'll have plenty of time afterwards for that. But think about that for the thing that, hey, I heard something that might help you in this problem. Think about that for one minute. Um, we would like to know, is there, are there people who are organizing events or conferences? Anyone? There's a few, few people here. Yeah. I have some questions for you. All the people I have quoted are public speakers. Yeah. Uh, did you notice something? Who noticed something?
I give him credit that I did something else as well. You might maybe not even notice it, but 62 of them were women. Okay. I know that, as you see, there's a lot of work to make much more women here. Um, but it, sometimes people organize to tell me it's impossible. They do exist. Okay. And how do I do this? Well, it's very simple. I just ask for help. I just ask some questions, I just send out. So if ever, if you want to find more women speakers to get a higher diversity, just ask me, uh, just send me and ask the community people around you because they are there and they are very good speakers. So please um, have them at your next conference. Thank you very much.